So warm. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome to Faith Community Church. My name is Tim, if we've never met before, and it's a great honor to welcome each and every one of you this morning. It's great to have you. And uh, for those of you at home, welcome to you as well. We're, gr we're grateful that we can gather this way. I know that uh, many of you are watching from home to protect loved ones right now from COVID, and uh, we're grateful for that. And I uh, just want to say we do miss you and hope that you're well. Well, we're beginning a new teaching series today called Coming In From The Cold, subtitle, Finding Faith in a Cynical World. Someone asked me this week if cynicism is the same as unbelief, as in, uh, you know, I, I hear someone make a claim and I'm shown proofs, but I'm just not going to believe it. Is that what cynicism is? And I said, uh, no, my understanding is that that would be skepticism, which is a little different. Skepticism is when you're presented with a claim and you don't believe it, and it's not always a bad thing. If you came to me and said that someone I love and admire had done some awful thing, I would be skeptical. I would say, I doubt it. And even if you presented me with proofs and evidence that your claim was true, I would still probably say, yeah, but I know that person, and I'm sure it's not the whole story. And that's appropriate. Some skepticism is wise. Otherwise, we get blown all over the place by every little thing that comes along. Cynicism is a different creature altogether. Cynicism is about assuming and assigning motive to what someone is doing. It's not just that I don't trust your information, it's that I don't trust you, or in some cases your tribe, and therefore your information is irrelevant to me. Cynicism assumes and assigns motive, and it generally assumes the worst about people. Cynicism is a way of looking at the world that assumes that everyone and everything around you is going to fail you because everyone is just looking out for their own self-interest. If it's true that we're just chemistry, okay, if we're just all molecules bumping into one another, then virtues like courage and honor and integrity and love and self-sacrifice, these are just chemical phenomena. They are not real. And so for the cynic, all virtue is a mirage. Now, this is not a, a religious argument that I'm making this morning, by the way. Philosophers have been talking about this for 150 years. The world is a cold place. And cynicism is one of the ways that we harden ourselves to survive in a cold and dark world. It protects us from being hurt and insulates us with a warm blanket of mocking and ridicule and straw men. And speaking as a pastor this morning, I'm going to tell you that cynicism is spiritually dangerous to your soul. Now, is it, is it always wrong not to trust people? Is it always wrong not to trust people? Everybody say no, please. No. In the second chapter of the Gospel of John, it says that people were flocking to Jesus because they saw the miracles he was doing. And John says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew what's in people. Jesus knew that their motives were insincere. Now that sounds like a cynic. But the trick is that Jesus is able to not trust people and not be bitter about it. He doesn't get hard. He doesn't dismiss people. He doesn't get rid of them. So the answer to cynicism isn't to be naive and just take everything at face value. The, the answer is to exercise wisdom that comes with humility. James chapter 3, verse 17 says, The wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Cynicism is spiritually dangerous because it requires us not to trust anyone but ourselves 
And it is possible to make yourself so hard to other people that you become spiritually blind and deaf. So that even if God were to come to you with a choir of angels and declare to you, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to to men, you'd say, sure. Right. No one cares. And it's no way to live. In this series, we're going to read through the opening chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Just one month in one chapter. The Gospel of Luke is sometimes called the Gospel of Wonder or the Gospel of Awe because so many people in the Gospel of Luke find themselves in awe and full of amazement. These are the Christmas stories. The stories of Gabriel and Mary and Joseph and their journey to Bethlehem and there's no room at the inn and so Jesus is born in a stable and he's laid in a manger. You know the You know, even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard the stories. We're going to read the scripture that Linus quotes in a Charlie Brown Christmas. There should be all kinds of warm feelings this month. And it is full of angels and astonishment and confusion. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to spend a weekend studying these scriptures with a group of university students from around the Midwest, and two things stood out to them that I want to share with you. The first is how ordinary and real the whole thing sounds. That when you actually slow down and take your time to read it, what strikes you is that As hard as it is to believe that angels would speak to an aging priest or that a teenage virgin would conceive and all of that, if it happened, though, this is what it would have been like. This is how ordinary people would have responded. That was the first thing that struck them. The other thing that struck them, though, and this surprised me a bit at the time, is that if you grant the premise that there is a God who created everything out of nothing, then actually the virgin birth and choirs of angels and an old couple having a baby and so on, they're actually not that hard to believe. In fact, they kind of fit a pattern. This is kind of how God is. Far, the, the, the thing that this group of students wrestled with most is that far from the coldness of a world that is just chemistry, Luke presents us with a world that is charged with purpose and wonder and awe. Where God is breaking into history in such a way that no one could have foreseen it or imagined it, and things like love and self-sacrifice and honor and faith can actually be learned and they are real things. And the, the question that they wrestled with the most was, could this really be what the universe is like after all? Is it possible that the purpose of the universe actually is awe and wonder? And that is the question we're going to look at this month. What we're going to do this Christmas season is just to give the invitation for one month, if you'd be willing, to just let cynicism go. Just for one month. Would you grant the possibility that the cynics only have half of it right? And that there is more than just molecules bumping into one another? I promise if you'd take us up on this, your Christmas would be a lot more fun Okay? There's going to be a lot more joy. And what we're going to do is read about real people who heard God is about to do the very thing you've longed for the most, and they're struggling to believe it. And God is, is, rather than dropping them, he's going to bring them along. He's going to give each of them something to help them pass through their unbelief into a mature and real faith. Now, all I'm going to do today, okay, is just set the table for the next month. All right, we're going to read four verses, 
And then I'm going to talk for like 55 minutes. It's going to be super fun. All I'm going to do is we're going to do some experimenting this morning with reading like a cynic. If we have time, we'll meet our first cynic, skeptic, skeptic. And then uh, we have a little challenge for you, okay? So let's everybody turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. You can find that on page 855 if you need to borrow a Bible from under the chairs in front of you. Let's all get it out. Even if you're a kid, you can find Luke chapter 1, verse 1, okay? And tell me when you're there, because I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Luke 1, 1. Inasmuch... As many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, let's do some reading. Like a cynic. We're going to deconstruct some deconstruction this morning, okay? One of the things you're going to notice right away is that the author never actually identifies himself as Luke. Technically, what we call the gospel according to Luke and its sequel, by the way, the Acts of the Apostles, so Luke and Acts are a two-volume set written by the same person. Technically, they are anonymous. That's true for all four gospels. This is often cited as a reason not to trust them. So eventually, you're going to have a professor or someone on YouTube tell you that Christians didn't start attaching titles to these Gospels until pretty late, and the titles don't always match. So we don't know who wrote them. The church assigned titles to suit their own agendas, and of course, those agendas must be sinister because that's the world we live in, baby. Just get over it. Okay. Luke didn't put his name on here. Ancient manuscripts came in scrolls, not books. And the, the, the name or the title of the book was often written on a tag that was sewn onto the edge of the scroll. So it wasn't technically part of the book. It's more like the Dewey Decimal numbers, you know, on the binding of our books in libraries today. So just because their names aren't in the book doesn't mean that they're actually anonymous. Now, with regard to the variety of titles, again, this is technically correct. This book, the Gospel of Luke, had many titles. Let me share with you a few. In the 5th century, we have a copy titled Gospel According to Luke. Some medieval manuscripts have Holy Gospel According to Luke. Others have divine beginning of the gospel according to Luke. And we have two copies from the 4th century that just say, according to Luke. My goodness, what be bewildering variety in the titles. So when someone on Instagram tells you that there have been a lot of different titles assigned to the book, they're right. But every single one of them that we have identifies Luke as the author. And that's true, by the way, for all four gospels. And this is true for manuscripts and parts of manuscripts from North Africa to Europe to Asia and Egypt. Everywhere we have found titles, they're always the same. I should say, they always assign them to the same person. So what about the notion that the church made up these stories and slapped an apostle's name on them to give them more weight? Okay, for that to work... That would require that churches from Europe, Africa, Asia, without the use of the telephone or the internet, all pick the same name. And the probability of that is, everyone say, zero. Zero. Also, if you were making up names, why would you choose Luke? If you're trying to give weight to your story, wouldn't you call it the gospel according to Andrew or the super awesome divine holy written gospel of James? Luke wasn't an eyewitness, he wasn't an apostle, he didn't live in Palestine, he's not even a Jew. So if you were making it up, you've picked a lousy candidate. 
Yet we don't, have, we don't have a single example from the ancient world of anyone ever assigning it to anyone from other than Luke. The first person to suggest that Luke is not the author lived in the 18th century. I said 18th, not 8th. The 18th century. So th there's no conspiracy here. This really was written by Luke. He really did write it in the first half of the, in the early in the second half of the first century. The real story here is that Luke's a lot like us. He wasn't a Jew. He's the only non-Jewish author of the Bible. He wasn't an eyewitness to the events. He's someone who never personally saw Jesus, yet he became convinced that not only was Jesus the king of Israel, but the king of the whole world. And his perspective is a gift to us. Between Luke and Acts, he wrote 27% of the New Testament. Someone like us. So that we would know that what we've heard about Jesus, you can trust. Now, he says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Who's the many? This is more fodder for cynical reading. Well, okay, he can't be talking about the Gospel of John because we know that came a lot later. And he can't be talking just about Mark and Matthew. I don't know what many means to you, but it's more than two, okay? Luke acknowledges in verse 2 that many have tried to put together a narrative of the things that have happened just as it was delivered by those who were eyewitnesses. And again, someone's going to compare this to a game of telephone. Have you ever heard someone talk about this? Do you know what the game of telephone is? Maybe I should clarify that because it's like 15 or 20 people in a row and you know you whisper some inane message down and by the end it's totally garbled and we all have a good laugh. Now imagine a game of telephone stretch over 30 years in multiple language on different continents and you see the problem. But we're talking about first century Jewish religious teaching and that is not how it works. So memorization was a predominant form of teaching in Israel. Disciples carefully memorized the teaching of their rabbi so they could pass it on to others. Religious teaching was also done in community. It's not a game of telephone. There was flexibility in transmitting stories and teaching, and that's why you're going to find variations in the exact words and exact details used in gospel stories. So, for example, Matthew reports an encounter with two demon-possessed men. Mark tells the same story, but there's just one demon-possessed man. It's not a contradiction. It's two perspectives on the same story. At the resurrection, for example, Matthew has an angel coming down from heaven like a bolt of lightning, rolling back the stone while the guards you know, pass out in shock and awe. Mark's gospel just has an angel sitting in the tomb when the women arrive. And Luke's gospel has two angels and they're standing next to the women. Does anyone seriously lack the imagination to see that all of these things could have happened? And that what we have are the recollections of multiple eyewitnesses who emphasized different aspects of the same story. And none of them is the main point. What is the main point of the story? There were freaking angels in an empty tomb. Whether there were two or 20 is almost irrelevant. And when these stories were being shared in the community, you can, st in, in traditional Middle Eastern villages, it's still done this way today. It was done in community. And even the youngest member of the circle could interrupt the speaker and correct him if he got off track. So you couldn't just create nonsense out of thin air. Tens of thousands of people saw what Jesus said and did. So if, if he didn't really heal people, if he didn't really restore sight to the blind, if he didn't really raise a little girl from the dead, someone would have said so. But as it is, we, we don't have a single person from the ancient world who's written down for us, hey, there are these crazy stories going around about Jesus of Nazareth, but I was there, and that's not what happened. Again, the real story is that what we are reading has come down to us through generations 
of faithful witnesses who have worshipped together and rehearsed these stories together. And in many cases, people who gave their lives to get this to us in a language that we can understand. That's the real story. Now, verse 1 also acknowledges that Mark, Luke, and Matthew weren't the first to write this stuff down. Jewish disciples took copious notes on what their rabbis were teaching. So I don't know, anybody keeping up with that uh, TV show, The Chosen? You should be. Okay, it's really, really good. But if you've been watching The Chosen, you've noticed probably that John and Matthew are always like scribbling things down on a little tablet. Well, that's a real thing. They really did that. Jewish disciples of all stripes did this with the teaching of their rabbi. So Matthew didn't just sit down one day and say, I'm going to try to remember all those things that happened 30 years ago. There was actually already a substantial body of written material floating around the churches of the ancient world. And their job, as Luke puts it in verse 3, was to gather it and arrange it in what he calls an orderly account. And there's a mountain of evidence for this in the Gospels themselves. I'm not, if you want to know more, come and ask me later. I'll share some books with you. But there's a branch of biblical scholarship called source criticism that has painstakingly taken apart Matthew, Mark, and Luke and compared them with one another. And this is the picture that emerges. That at minimum, there were four or five collections of Jesus' teaching already circulating when Matthew, Mark, and Luke sat down to put their books together. So as early as Luke is, what we're reading was written down way earlier. Okay, we just spent eight months in a letter called 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is one of the very earliest things ever written down in the New Testament. And Paul is able to quote the teaching of Jesus to a mostly non-Jewish congregation on another continent. His quotation lines up perfectly with the Gospel of Mark, which doesn't even exist yet. Mark is Peter's secretary, not Paul's, and Paul assumes they've already heard it. One last thing. What is, what's the most unique part of the Gospel of Luke? It's the Christmas stories. Almost, you know, not, you know, yeah, almost all the information that we have about Jesus' early life comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke is probably from Asia Minor. What apostle spent the last few decades of his life in Asia Minor? Does anyone know? For 1,000 points, 10,000 points. John, maybe Paul too. You get 50 points just for talking to me, but John. <laughs> John. And who was probably with John? Mary, the mother of Jesus. When Jesus died, he committed his mother into John's care. And church tradition has always held that she was with him in Asia Minor, where Luke also lived. How is it that Luke can write several times in these stories, Mary treasured all of these things up in her heart? Because he talked to her. Why am I telling you all this? I just spent 2,300 words telling you where Luke comes from. Half of you are asleep. Wake up now. I am trying to tell you that you can trust what is written here. That it really was written by Luke. That it was written really early. Some of it may have been written as Jesus was saying it. And he wrote it down so that we would have, what's the word? Certainty with regard to what we have been taught. And I'm sharing this because someday you're going to learn that the Bible did not fall out of heaven in King James English, that translation is involved, that our English Bibles are translations of translations, and sometimes translations of translations of translations, that there's a whole history of manuscripts copied and recopied over centuries and centuries to give us the Bible that we have today. Sooner or later, you're going to figure out that there are differences between the stories in the Gospels, that the authors of the Gospels depended on other written material, that the resurrection stories aren't 
aren't identical in all of their details, that the genealogies of Mark and or that, that Matthew and Luke are different, that the teaching of Jesus is almost never presented in exactly the same way in any of the four Gospels, that they arrange the orders of the events differently, that they are written anonymously, their titles have been changed, They're, that bringing the Bible together was a profoundly human endeavor, that Catholic, Orthodox, and Coptic Christians even have different books in their Bible, that Jesus was not born on December 25th, and we do not know how many wise men there really were. And all of this is going to be presented to you through the most cynical lens you can imagine. That somehow these straw men, like Jesus wasn't born on Christmas Day, somehow are the linchpin of Christian faith. And that it cannot be trusted. And I am here to tell you just because we're teaching from Luke 1, 1 through 4, and I get to do so. That we know. We've known for a thousand years all of these things. None of this is a secret. We have thousands and thousands of manuscripts of the Bible. You can go see them for yourself in the British Museum if you're rich, or the, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., or Google if you're just a normal person. We're not hiding anything. We know that the Bible was written by people, copied by people, translated by people. None of this is a shock to anyone. And it is a beautiful thing that the same God who became one of us at Christmas has chosen to speak through us and to preserve his word through us and to deliver it through us. And there's no conspiracy. We don't talk about it because it doesn't change anything really. All these manuscripts of the Bible, you know, with all the different variations, we tell you about them at the bottom of your page. The bottom of every page of your Bible lists all the differences between the manuscripts. Let me sh let's look at the next page. Here's just a few. Shocking. Some manuscripts add, blessed are you among women. Ooh. Some manuscripts add, of you. Oh. Some add, for there will be. I don't know if Jesus is Lord. How can it be? I, there's nothing to hide here. It's all been done in the open. It's all been done publicly. I have a friend here on the staff team here at Faith Community Church who has this, this is wonderful. She shared this wonderful story about her grandmother. Her grandmother wrote a little book for all of her grandchildren. And she begins the book by saying, you know, you've heard about so-and-so and so-and-so, you've heard this family story. I wanted to write this down for you so that you would know what they were really like and what really happened. That's really sweet. Well, immediately, there's a little cynic in every American heart that springs up and says, Did Grandma really write you a book? Who does that? How do we know that grandma wrote this book? We actually have found a paper that she wrote in 1944. We have compared the text exhaustively, and we're pretty sure that no more than 30% of grandma's book can actually be attributed to grandma. In fact, we're pretty sure it was a great uncle, Bart, who wrote the book to slander a great aunt, Marge. So it's actually not about love. It's about vengeance. By the way, we found one of your cousin's copies of the book. There are people in your cousin's genealogy, we're not even sure they're real. There are stories in your cousin's book that don't appear in your copy of the book. And there are differences on every single page. So what's grandma's real agenda? That's how cynicism works. Same data Two different sets of assumptions about texts and authors and motivations and grammars. Listen to these radically different responses from scholars to the Christmas stories we're going to read this month. Based on his description of towns, cities, and other geographical features, as well as the naming of various officials, archaeologist Sir William Ramsey wrote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, he should be placed along with the very greatest 
of historians. Professor of Classics at Auckland University, E. M. Blakelock, wrote, for accuracy of detail and for evocation of atmosphere, Luke stands with Thucydides. He's a really cool guy. This is not the shoddy product of pious imagining, but a trustworthy record. And the spade work of archaeology was the first to reveal the truth. New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson says Luke's account is selected and shaped to suit his apologetic interests, not in defiance of, but in conformity to the ancient standards of historiography. Then on the other side, you have scholar Mark Powell, who says, it is doubtful whether the writing of history was ever Luke's intent. He wrote to, pro to proclaim, to persuade, and to interpret. He did not write to preserve records for posterity. And awareness of this has been for many the final nail in Luke's, the historian's coffin. It isn't, it isn't the virgin birth. It isn't choirs of angels. It isn't angels outside of Bethlehem that are really hard to believe. The issue is, which vision of reality is true? If the world we live in is a random accident in which we are born, we live out our meaningless lives, and we die, then it is a cold world indeed. Or is it the stage upon which God is telling an almost unbelievable story of love, glory, beauty, and goodness? That is the issue. Christians will never deny that the world is a dark place. But it is also charged with wonder and beauty and awe. And Christmas reminds us every year of that truth. Theophilus is a Greek name. It means friend of God. So for that reason, a lot of people have postulated that Theophilus wasn't even a real person. He's just sort of a, um, a stand-in for all non-Jewish converts to Christianity. Totally possible. Not a big deal. I tend to think Theophilus was a real person because it would be a little weird to address an imaginary conglomeration of people as most excellent and all the U's are singular in verses 3 and 4. But all we know about Theophilus is that he's almost certainly not a Jew. He was not an eyewitness to what happened in Palestine. And he was probably either a part of the church or had been at one time. The word taught in verse 4 is the word catechize. He had been catechized in the faith. So he's a part of that generation of Christians that depended on the testimony of others, just like we do, to determine what he believed. And he is struggling with his faith. And Luke wrote so that he would have certainty concerning what he'd been taught. Just like my friend's grandmother. I just want you to know there are answers to the questions that you have. There is no sinister agenda. And your faith could be grounded and more mature on the other side of your questions. Now, there's this phrase in the story of Mary that has really grabbed some of us who've been putting this series together. In verse 45, Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Blessed is the one who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. All we want to do this month is, is invite anyone that would be willing to say, could you leave cynicism alone for one month? Would you be open to the possibility for just one month that maybe the cynics have only half of the story and that the world isn't just darkness and cold. And that God has done something and is continuing to do something in the lives of the most ordinary people that give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and lead our feet in the way of peace. That's verse 79. And blessed is the one who hears and believes. You guys have this little card on your chairs. Can you grab that real quick? Everybody grab it. Oh, where's my card? I 
almost lost my card. When I was serving on campus with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, we would do this thing with students where we would say, we want you to think of the person on campus that you believe is least likely to ever care about Jesus. And we would have them write their names down. We'd say, we're just asking you to pray for them every day this year and to ask God for an opportunity to make an invitation. I'm gonna share a quick story about my wife. When my wife was a freshman, she was given this challenge at UW-Platteville and she wrote down the name of her roommate. She didn't know the Lord. She loved to party, had a boyfriend, living the dream. And she prayed for her every day. At one point, she made an invitation. She said, I'll call her Tammy, that's not her name, Tammy. I just want you to know that I care about you and I'm praying for you. And if you ever have anything you want me to pray about, you just tell me and I will. She actually left this piece of paper on her desk, said, you just write it down. Tammy never took her up on that offer, ever. And she flunked out of school. (laughs) And years later, more than 10 years later, she reached out to my wife through Facebook. She said, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a Christian. And you were a big part of that. And here are pictures of my kids and my husband. And we love the Lord together. The fact is that darkness and cold are not the whole story. That God is always doing more than you think. So this is our challenge to you this month. You have a card. On the top it says three reasons not to invite. Let's get our cynic on right now. Just get it out. I have a friend's name here. I won't tell it. I won't say it because we're on the interweb. I have six reasons because I'm an overachiever. I'm going to share those with you now just to prime the pump, okay? You're going to write today, okay? I've invited him many times. He's always said no. He's been really, really hurt by the church in the past. He's not agnostic because he hasn't thought about it. He has. He's a really smart guy. I'm preaching, and that's super awkward. You can't use that. Okay, that's just fine. Finally, he's pretty self-righteous. He's a proud guy, and he's hard, very hard. Down below that, there are three things. We have three things happening in the next two months that if you have an opportunity to make an invitation, here are some things you can consider. First of all, our coming in from the cold series, November 28th through December 4th. I promise we will not be this philosophical in the rest of the series, okay? I'm just setting the table today. But you could invite a friend. Christmas is coming, December 23rd and 24th. And Christianity Explored is coming in January of 2022. Pastor Tim Porter, he's got a great team uh, put together. This is a seven-week class where you can come and ask any question that you want about faith. Write down who you want to invite. Then why are you going to do it? We have a fill in the blank there for you. But I have three reasons because I'm an overachiever. Here's what I wrote. Because I love him. He's my friend. He can watch online, so it's super easy. That's already three. Let's keep going. Because blessed is the one who hears and believes. And this is my real reason. Because Luke tells me that we're not the only players on the stage. That God is always doing more than we know. Through the most ordinary people in the most ordinary circumstances, God is always moving things ahead. We may have no idea. You have no idea when it is your friend's time. So I want to encourage you, just make an invitation. I'm going to give you 90 seconds to fill out your card. Then we're going to say, 90 seconds. Ready, set, go.
All right. Thanks for writing. You can take more time if you want to. Last thing I'll invite you to do, you'll notice it folds in half, and then you can tear it in two. We have fires going right outside the front door. I'm going to invite you, if you want, burn the top half. All the reasons not to do it, just let it go. And I want to challenge you this month, pray for your friend every day. And just ask God to do something new and amazing in their life, all right? Let's stand and sing as we wrap things up this morning.